President Barack Obama, for whom he coordinated the administration's climate policy initiatives. We're here today to talk about the implications of, of climate change and the role it'll play in reshaping President global Barack populations Obama, and migration. Uh, this is an issue I know you both have been engaged in for a long time. I want to note that Secretary Kerry, you've written uh, about climate and migration an article for the World War Zero magazine on the World War Zero website, uh, Frontlines, and, uh, and that magazine is full of really important pieces about climate and migration and subjects of similar concern for, for folks who want to go a little bit deeper. Um, this July, I published uh, the first part in a series about climate migration with the New York Times and with the Pulitzer Center. And that was a piece that examined the global pressures brought by food insecurity and driving very large displacement of people out of South Asia, out of Africa and Central America, and it zeroed in on how the climate crisis might push tens of millions of migrants to the U.S. out of Central American countries of Guatemala and El Salvador and Mexico uh, with potentially destabilizing effects. Um, there's two more pieces to come in that series, a look at, at internal displacement in the United States and a look at the geopolitical implications uh, of, of the large movement of populations globally. Um, now, for better or worse, we're talking today at a moment that might prove a turning point for, for Americans about what climate change really means. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, logging in from California, where wildfires and heat waves have more or less taken over the state, uh, most of the Northwest, uh, from Washington to Colorado. It's also hurricane season, and we've already seen more named storm seen more named storms this season in the first three months than we typically do in an entire year. And so, this is a particular urgent. There's particular urgency to this moment and this issue, and uh, I don't think it's been broadly felt before. And um, hoping perhaps that presents an opportunity to uh, to break through in this conversation. And so, I really look forward to hearing from you both today, your perspectives as we go forward. And uh, and uh, let's jump into to some of the questions. Secretary Kerry, um, you've been talking about the nexus of climate change and human migration as Secretary of State for a long time, going back to uh, a speech in 2015 or even before. Can you talk a little bit about how you see these trends, uh, migration, climate, uh, both developing and intersecting and why they're so important? Uh, what it is what it is about the these issues that brought it to the forefront for you? Um, maybe there's a couple stories or, or uh, you know, anecdotes about, uh, you know, about uh, what, uh, you know, drove your initial concern. Well, Abram, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for being part of this discussion. And thanks for your uh, diligent work in helping to, uh, you know, bring this to larger public awareness. And John Podesta, I'm thrilled to be here with John always. He's one of our savvy folks in uh, the senior ranks of uh, the American security uh, establishment and, and um, his role has been critical and I worked with him very closely when he was with uh, President Obama in, in the White House, obviously. Um, so, uh, and thank you for mentioning Frontlines. Frontlines actually does have, it's, a, it's our online magazine that has some terrific uh, articles in it and, and I think it's worth the read. So, um, migration, climate crisis, uh, they, are, they are integrally intertwined. I mean, this is not, a, this is not some pie in the sky future uh, dilemma that we may face uh, that people are talking about hypothetically. It's already happening. And it has been happening for some period of time. Uh, and the linkage could not be more clear. I mean, it's common sense as well as uh, obvious evidence that's uh, leading people to this. Uh, climate, the climate crisis, the crisis of the warming of our planet at a, at a, at a pace that is faster and more, more uh, tangible than at any time in our history, uh, is changing the ability of people to be able to live in certain places. Already, we have seen I mean, in the island states of the planet, uh, there are about 44 states or so or islands that are going to disappear because of sea level rise. I know my friend, the president of Palau, Tommy Remengensau, 20 years ago, he was talking about adaptation and mitigation. Those aren't options for him anymore. Now he's talking about where do his people move to in order to live. Uh, we saw 121, 128, 130 degrees temperature in various cities. Pakistan had a city at that temperature. The Middle East had a couple of places. Death Valley, just a few days ago, California was at that pace. So that is unlivable. 
for most human beings, you can't go outdoors, you go outdoors for a few hours, the temperatures at the end of the century will be such at the rate we're going, they just can't live. And so people are gonna to move to places where they think they can leave. They'll fight over places that they wanna to move to, to try to live. And we've seen how the movement of vast numbers of people, desperate for livelihood, for survival, uh, for a place to live and, and share what other people get to share in other places in the world, the pressure on that is gonna grow markedly. We will have millions, tens of millions of climate refugees, migrants, and a refugee and a migrant are not always the same thing, though they often are, but we've seen the pressure. I saw firsthand as Secretary of State how President uh, Erdogan of Turkey would just turn up his migration dial. It wasn't a real spontaneous migration. He would push people out the refugee camp door, shoving them towards Europe, promising them a better life, and literally the politics of Europe. Ask Angela Merkel what happened in Germany. The politics of Europe changed dramatically, and people began to get scared. And then you have the rise of the alt-right, and you have all kinds of pressures on your politics. So you can have wars that come from this migration as people fight for water holes, as they fight for a homestead. You will have massive pushback by people in various countries that can amount to genocide at times. Uh, we've seen what happened with the Rohingya who are homeless. It's not entirely climate related. I don't want to pretend it is, but there are questions of where you can live associated with what has happened to them. And um, I think it is very clear to people that if we're going to try to reestablish a, a means of managing the affairs of state and of the planet and dealing with global issues, we're going to have to deal with this. People are moving from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, where they can no longer farm. They've had years now of drought. And the drought, any scientist will tell you that the drought is what is now contributing to the fires in California, the intensity of the fires, coupled with the warming of the oceans, which puts more moisture in the air, which then results in greater flooding. So you have this yin yang uh, extreme hitting you, floods, drought, uh, and places just become unlivable in that context. So long story short, uh, there are all kinds of political uh, ideological implications in this, and there are practical realities. In Syria, this was not the cause of the Arab uprising, it was not the cause of the civil war, but it contributed very significantly to the intensity of the war when a million plus people moved in from the desert where they no longer could raise their livestock, they no longer could live, they came into Damascus, and anyone will tell you that that contributed very significantly to the capacity for the unrest uh, and insurgency that followed. So let me let John jump in here. But this is, uh, you know, you don't have to be a scientist to understand the logical connection of rising temperatures, inability to produce food, interruption of water, uh, lack of capacity to survive and thrive. And so you move. And when you move, that will cause conflict. That's a, a bleak picture. We'll come back to so many of the things that, that you mentioned. Um, but to go a little bit deeper, uh, Mr. Podesta, you talked about you've you've talked about and written about the notion of climate without borders, and and others I've spoken with have framed this as an issue of uh, you know of regional challenges that defy you know, sort of traditional political boundaries, um, and 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 thus maybe defy or or at least challenge some of, of the, the the tensions that uh, Secretary Kerry is talking about. Can you talk a little bit about what that what that means a, a climate without borders? Um, what what that means in terms of uh, our, our goals or what's necessary to begin to address some, you know, some of these, these climate and migration challenges that, that are arising um, in practical well, terms. Thanks, Andrew. And I think, look, Secretary Kerry laid it out extremely well. The, uh, you can't build a wall to stop climate change. <laughs> you know, we're, we're contributing to a problem that is the uh, most fundamental problem of human security going forward uh, every day. And we're not taking the necessary steps to begin to reduce the pollution that is poisoning our planet. And as the secretary noted, the uh, if people can't feed their children, if they're upended through flooding, if their homes are are uh, you know vanish, 
uh, because of sea level rise or, uh, or extreme weather events, they're gonna go someplace. And they're gonna, uh, it's, you, can, you can try to, you know, to keep those forces from <laughs> affecting your own population. But in the United States, we're seeing the internal uh, movement of, of, of people right now. You know, you just have to turn on the television to see people evacuating uh, large parts of uh, of the American West right now in Oregon and in Washington and uh, in California with the with the extreme uh, fires. Uh, we'll see that uh, more uh, evident in the loss of water resource uh, again in the American West. So these are compounding problems. You know, uh, in 2010, I think the Pentagon does a four year planning document called the Quadrennial Defense Review. Uh, and for the first time, they said that climate change was a threat multiplier in that document. And I would say today, we have to stop thinking about it as a threat multiplier. It is the threat. It's threatening, uh, it's threatening the well-being, the livelihood of people around uh, the planet. Uh, we face the, the prospect as the uh, UN uh, uh, report on biodiversity pointed out of losing an eighth of species on the planet by mid-century, an eighth of the species on the planet going extinct by mid-century. Uh, the uh, World Wildlife uh, Fund just issued a report that said uh, we've had in just in the last 50 years, this is partly because of, of development, it's, it's for a lot of causes, but a good chunk of this is the result of changing uh, patterns of weather, we've uh, lost 68% uh, uh, of the uh, wildlife uh, on the planet. So these things are compounding, they're multiplying. And by mid-century, we're going to be looking, the UN today predicts we're going to have 50 million climate refugees by, by 2050. I think that's really on the low end. <laughs> The, the predictions that uh, the scientists have been making are always within a range. We seem to either be at the high end of that range of disaster or overshooting that range. So it's time to you know, really get serious about this, not only uh, begin to tackle the problem of reducing the pollution through mitigation as is on the ballot in, uh, in, in, in our country in 2020 between uh, strong plans that the Vice President Biden's put out versus the denial that is coming from Donald Trump in the White House. But we have to begin to uh, enter, you know, in, engage in a global conversation about how we're going to manage this uh, surge of population movement uh, in a way that's going to uh, respect human dignity uh, and provide people with the capacity. Uh, to 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 um, find a way uh, to survive in in an increasingly warming planet. So let's talk a little bit about specifically how how uh, you might envision doing that in the Obama administration. Uh, you you worked to craft policy on climate change and and examined how it would impact global stability. Tell us what that means and what specifically uh, was the Obama administration preparing to do with regards to climate induced migration in particular uh, to ameliorate some of the challenges you're just. You're describing. Well, you know, I think we're we're just at the beginning of the imagination of how big the problem was, and that's just a few years ago. You know, obviously the the, the president did what he could uh, uh, under existing authority to to get in the game by, I, and I think this is the most important thing for the for the United States, which is to change its own energy system to go from a a uh, highly polluting fossil-based system to a clean and renewable uh, energy system. And the president put a lot of uh, effort and energy into that. That formed the uh, basis to engage in international conversations to challenge other countries to increase their ambition. Uh, Secretary Kerry le led our efforts to engage the Chinese. Uh, ultimately, President Obama and President Xi's uh, uh, joint statement in the fall of 2014 really uh, ignited uh, uh, the global uh, commitments that uh, were formed the basis of the Paris Agreement. So 
action here uh, led to the ability to do climate diplomacy uh, first, uh, again, with, with China to get them to uh, put some uh, a, an ambitious uh, target on the table. And that sort of opened the door, uh, as the secretary will tell you, to a global agreement. The same thing has to happen on, uh, with respect to adaptation uh, and building resilience uh, into the global system. The Obama administration started by on that. Uh, first, again, using its own resources, the president issued an executive order, uh, 13677, that uh, in said that all decision makings, decision making on uh, development assistance had to take climate into account. Uh, so that uh, as we were building projects and helping uh, countries develop their economies and uh, tackle their own health challenges, you had to think about what was the future going to look like? It made no sense to, to uh, kind of build things that wouldn't survive uh, the, either the, the change in, uh, in uh, the physical environment or the, uh, the social changes that were likely to result from climate change. Uh, he made a big commitment to the Green Climate Fund, the international fund that uh, will help, again, developing countries build uh, support for their societies. And uh, we, but we, we need much more attention and much more commitment to try to think about how we're going to be able to let people, uh, if where they can, live in place, but in societies that, uh, that are committed to some kind of stability. Most of the people who are going to be displaced are going to be internally displaced. Uh, right now, uh, in 2019, uh, 80 million people were forcibly displaced most of those people inside their boundaries of their country. Uh, but they have, uh, they need some place to go. In Syria, as the secretary pointed out, you know, they went into the cities. That added pressure that led to uh, some of the, what went into uh, the civil war in Syria. Uh, but there's also gotta be uh, the, the capacity uh, to kind of anticipate this, to anticipate what it means to food systems, clean water, uh, and to be able to build for that future. Yeah. Secretary Kerry, uh, as part of my project, uh, the story in the New York Times Magazine in July, uh, we tried to model proactively, um, uh, predictably, what would happen in Central America is food insecurity, the kind of food insecurity that, uh, that John describes, um, uproots more people. And our data suggested that countries like Guatemala and El Salvador, that they uh, will experience extraordinary urbanization. Um, and it also suggested that as many as 30 million migrants might be coming to the U.S. over the next 30 years as part of uh, partly influenced by climate change. Um, so how, how has this movement already been destabilizing for the United States to the extent that it's begun? And, and if the scale that's forecasted uh, or suggested by our, mo our models come to be, what would that mean for U.S. stability and, and U.S. interests in, in the future, um, particularly with respect to our southern border? Well, there are all kinds of implications in, 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 in the answer to, to your question because uh, I mean, the United States is a country, and I believe will remain a country that will continue to welcome people to our shores through legal immigration. Uh, and legal immigration is the key. And we're having a huge political battle over that now. We've been stalemated on this issue, polarized for a number of years, and we've seen how divisive and dangerous it is in our own country. I mean, when we have... Uh, <laughs> I mean, we've, we've just seen recently what happens when you have vigilantes trying to enforce the law. Um, but we've had vigilante. We've had people going down as part of so-called national militia uh, and, and reinforcing our border. You can imagine if 30 million people are trying to move in. And obviously, I don't think that's going to happen because I think we'll have a sensible policy between us and Latin America. I mean, when Joe Biden was vice president and uh, I was... Uh, uh, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee at the time, we were very involved with the uh, Central American presidents of countries to help deal with the problem, particularly of children migration, uh, which was coming about because of the violence, because of the lack of opportunity, because of uh, um, the lack of uh, education and so on. Um, so uh, we put together a plan 
not unlike the plan we once put together called Plan Colombia, where we put a billion dollars on the table and became deeply involved with President Uribe and managed to pull Colombia back from being a failed state. You can't just talk about it. You can't just uh, exploit the idea of the emotions that go with it and, and the building of a wall, which Donald Trump has done. You have to do something about it. And, and doing something is not just building a wall or trying to build a wall. It's helping to provide an alternative life for those folks, helping to provide alternatives where millions of people will make a different decision. That's, that's critical to what we have to do. But um, you know, if we're gonna grow as a nation and our economy is gonna continue to grow, we're gonna continue, I think, to have legitimate uh, immigration because that's been the staple of our economy. The, the folks who come in beginning at the bottom of the ladder are the ones who have helped to build America in the best sense of the word, and they do a lot of jobs that other people just won't do. Uh, so you, you work that way, and hopefully more people struggling to get into the middle class will actually not have to struggle as hard. We'll have a fairer economy, and we'll have a fairer America again. That's a whole different discussion. Let me come back to this for a minute, though. John uh, talked appropriately about what do we do about this. I mean, the solution is not going to come by just dealing with this problem of people from Central America. This is a global problem. It's a global problem. 85% of all the emissions in the world are coming from 20 countries. Over 50% of all the emissions of the world are coming from three entities, the United States of America, the EU, and China. Over 50%. So those are the countries, frankly, that have the greatest responsibility to move rapidly to do something. And we did that in the context of the Obama administration where we had a, what we call the major emitters group and we came together to talk about what we need to do. But here's the problem. <laughs> despite Paris, despite all the best uh, intent, uh, it's just not happening. We're, we're heading towards, if you did everything that we laid out that we needed to do in Paris, we would still be rising to 3.7 degrees centigrade. That's catastrophic. But we're not doing everything we laid out in Paris. So we're going way beyond 3.7 degrees right now. We're heading to 4.1 or 4.5 degrees. You can't, that is just, uh, you know, such a catastrophic uh, impact on our uh, biosystem and on our planet that it's hard to even describe to people. But let's hope we don't have to, we don't get there. In the solving of this problem, Abram, there are millions of jobs, better health, greater security, a greater capacity for nation states to come together in the United Nations and elsewhere and prove that we have the ability to work together and solve these problems. And doing that will do more to stabilize the world and calm down the anxiety and emotions that are giving rise to this nationalistic populism uh, which is very destructive to the notion of an order. So the United States has to step up again. We have to do what President Obama licensed me to do, which was go to China, sit down with President Xi, and talk about mutual interests, and build on what I already knew, and, and both John and I have relationships with an unspoken hero of all this effort, a fellow named Xi uh, Jinhua, who was the Chinese uh, envoy for climate, who really did believe in it and really did work at trying to do things. So we were able to work together so that President Obama and President Xi could stand up together two years before Paris and announce what we were gonna do. Now, China is about to bring 21 gigawatts of coal-fired power online. India poised to do slightly less, but similarly huge amounts. That's gonna kill us. That's gonna kill the efforts to deal with climate. So the United States, What's at stake in this election is putting us in a position again to go right back to China and start a sensible conversation, not just about climate, obviously about the economy and the rules of the road and technology theft and all these other things which are legitimate concerns. But if we don't get China on board to help us lead all development efforts over the next years, and then India and Brazil and, uh, you know, a group of other countries, and we're not gonna get this done. I'm just telling it like it is. Can we do it? Yes. It's not a lack of capacity. It's a lack of political will and leadership. And we have to turn that around.
Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to come back to both China uh, in a in a couple of minutes, but also uh, uh, John to ask you about uh, you know solutions. But before that, I just want to before we leave the issue of the U.S. border, Secretary Kerry, I just want to ask you a, you know a, a follow up because this is really you know in the end there is you know a need for uh, for practical and prag pragmatic response to this issue, and for the United States, the rubber meets the road at, at the border. So so how do you talk about these these issues uh, you know without um, sort of being pinned as, you know, as being for, for open borders. Uh, you know, what, what is this? I, I'd be happy. That's, I'm glad you asked the question. It's a really important question. Democrats have been, I think, not uh, as uh, thoughtful as we might be in the language we've chosen and the ways that we approach this. Uh, I used to be in law enforcement. I ran one of the largest DA's offices. I worked with ICE. I know all the ins and outs of this. But I believe in borders. If you don't have borders, you don't have nations. You have to have the legality of your visa system, the legality of immigration. You have to enforce all of that. And the thing that was missing in, in our approach for many years, I think, was an adequate recognition to the average citizen in America that you have to play by the rules. Now, that doesn't mean you shut down immigration. You shut people out. You've got to, you've got to, you know, you've got to person up your agency to deal with that adequately so that people know they can legitimately find a way to be able to immigrate and that we have a legitimate control of the border. But the first, you do have to have border enforcement. That said, you also have to have a humane uh, and, and fundamentally fair system where people who came here 30 years ago, the dreamers, many of them as we call them, 20 years ago, they played by the rules, they paid their taxes, they haven't been arrested. They're, they're doing, in many, some of them doing better for our country, paying into Social Security and other things than other citizens. Uh, and the fact is that uh, we're not going to deport 12 million people. Let's be serious. So we have to stop exploiting the issue and get that pathway to citizenship that gives everybody a sense that the system is fair and it doesn't become an incentive for more people to break down the door and come in illegally. I think you can balance that. And in fact, in the United States Senate, we came extremely close to doing that. There was goodwill on both Democrat and Republican side, and it got, it became the political football that it unfortunately has become too much. So we have to, we have to really find a, a common will to, to bring people together of both sides of the party, compromise and put together a sensible program that people have confidence in because it does respect rule of law. It also respects rule of humanity and common sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Podesta, you recently wrote uh, a really comprehensive, uh, phenomenal piece with the Brookings Institution about the issues that we're talking about. Um, among the, the points that you raise in that article, you write about how short-term investments in things like water infrastructure uh, in Northwest Africa, for example, could have an impact on climate-induced migration out of that region. I saw similar things through my reporting, but the impact of World Food Program aid or foreign aid uh, to really make a difference in Guatemala or El Salvador. Can you describe a little bit about uh, you know, how, uh, why this uh, engagement uh, you know, in, um, you know, in foreign continents on, on, on this issue uh, makes a difference and how, what its implications are for US national security interests, how it, how it protects us? Uh, uh, of course, and uh, I think this also adds to what the secretary just said about immigration, which I completely agree with. But if you don't help people live where they are, the immigration problem just becomes more intense, whether it's on our southern border in the arc of instability from the Middle East to South Asia, people are going to move if they can't live where they're, where, you know, where they currently reside. So it's very important, I think, to build the systems that are necessary uh, to provide food security, human security in those places. And we have a vested interest in that. If, you, uh, if nothing better demonstrates that, uh, then it is COVID-19, the public health crisis that we're seeing that's flying around the globe, killing people all, you know, we're doing the worst. Uh, you know, maybe there's a, maybe there's an argument that Brazil is uh, we're we're in, in close competition with Brazil for doing the worst, but these problems move, 
And if you don't invest in the systems uh, in advance to try to imagine what the problem is going to be and try to build uh, in the climate case, build resilience into the system, then they're going to spill over your border. And I think that um, just as uh, President Bush did with PEPFAR and the other initiatives that he did on malaria, investing in public health, investing in the systems that permit people uh, to, uh, again, uh, have a decent measure of life uh, and uh, health uh, in country, in places like Africa, uh, are critical to creating a, a, a global system and a global economy that's going to be well functioning. And if you if you don't do those, if if you don't do that, if you you pay no attention to it, if you kind of uh, try to you know just build a moat around the country, pretend these problems aren't going to come to you, they will come, as we've seen with COVID nineteen. They will, and and we will see with climate if we don't take our responsibility to both change our energy system, reduce emissions encourage others to follow in that path, but also help uh, less developed countries to uh, invest in the systems of stability in the ability uh, to create resilience in their own uh, societies and economies that really go all the way down to the, uh, to the community level. And, uh, you know, I think that's what, uh, I think that's what President Obama was trying to do. I'm quite convinced that's what President Biden would try to do, uh, but we have gone on a different path. We, we have exploited division, hate, fear uh, at the expense of trying to find a solution that is going to be the best solution for the American public so that these problems don't kind of completely overwhelm our own country. And again, I come back to the fires and the hurricanes. I think the politics of this is of, of climate has changed because people are experiencing it every day. They see what's happening. They know that uh, it is not because people didn't rake the forest in California that two million acres in California are burning, that uh, people are fleeing uh, the areas south of Portland, that uh, Washington uh, state is on fire, that Colorado, uh, had a respite from uh, from its fire season with some extreme weather there. It's gonna happen and people know it. And now again, as the secretary said, we need the political will to both change our energy system and invest in more human security around the planet. Yeah, I mean, I agree this, this seems like a moment of opportunity, but also uh, with what you've both said about how much time has been been lost in, in recent years. So, so, you know, on the political challenge of, of trying to turn that corner, I mean, how do you, how do you prove to Americans that investment in economic development in Guatemala or Honduras or Northwestern Africa, um, you know, is a good return for the United States? How do you, how do you make that conversation uh, effective and, and resonate? Well, you know, look, I, I think uh, right now it's going to be first things first. We're, we're in the middle of uh, a, a, a you know, fierce recession. We're going to have high unemployment uh, for a good period of time. We've seen uh, uh, millions of small businesses go out of business. Those jobs uh, have gone with them. So I think that the, uh, the first thing we need to do is invest in putting our own people back to work doing the work that needs to get done uh, by building a cleaner economy. But I think as we're doing that, I think what real leadership means is explain to people what the stakes are, why are the relatively small amounts, you know, pe uh, American people have a very exaggerated sense of what we spend on, uh, on foreign aid and development assistance. They think it's something like 30% of the federal budget when it's less than half a percent of the of federal budget. But those investments, uh, uh, return tremendous dividends in terms of peace and security, uh, the re relieving the pressure on uh, migration, both uh, here and abroad, and sort of building uh, instruments of, of stability that breed peace rather than war and conflict. So if, if you uh, are concerned about the United States military being overextended in places around the world, one of the things, and I think uh, 
almost every to a person, every top military leader in the country would say, these are good investments. They produce uh, uh, high returns for, from a security perspective uh, to, uh, to the American people. A question for you both, but Secretary Kerry, maybe to hear your thoughts first. I mean, staying on on this issue of politics and and a bit of division. I mean, this is an issue that can stimulate um, enormous empathy and action. Or as you know, as we're seeing in so many ways now, it can also uh, you know stir the opposite, a, a reflexive protectionism, a rise in a rise in nationalism and and hate. So. So what's the risk, in your view, that the climate and migration become an even greater catalyst for, for nationalism um, and a sort of reversal you know, of globalization? What's the possibility that, um, you know, that this issue of climate migration, instead of being not acknowledged at all, uh, gets taken up itself by, uh, by conservatives uh, you know, to further their own political views on, you know, on immigration and, and global relationships? Well, some already have, some are already exploiting it there. But the, the fact is, I think John will agree, the greater threat is that if you don't deal with climate soon, rapidly, uh, you will have a whole bevy of politicians who are exploiting the negative consequences of not having done so. So it's not that you're suddenly gonna turn around and everybody will sing Kumbaya and respond and go get the job done. They'll just blame China or blame Brazil or blame somebody else. And we will have a nationalistic populist rising, uh, which will, I think, obscure much of the real debate that people need to have about healthcare and education and opportunity and so forth. It will really get, I think, into an exploitative period. So I view this effort to try to respond to climate crisis with the legitimacy that it deserves, I view that as a, as sort of a, an opportunity here to avoid some of the worst consequences of where our politics are going. And I think that there again, uh, we have to change the language a little bit. I mean, there, there's, you know, I, I've been guilty of it previously. I mean, you, you, there's been too much focus on the, I have to say this delicately, all of these things are worth focusing on, whether the polar bears are gonna disappear and the ice is gonna melt and the downstream consequences of the coral reefs, et cetera. But we're ignoring the largest marketplace the world has ever known. The solution to climate change is energy policy. And energy policy is opportunity. Uh, if we will get about the business of being the world's greatest innovator and the world's greatest creative entity to be producing the batteries necessary to get 20 days of storage, 25 days of storage, we're going to get there. The challenge is going to be we're going to get there in time. And we need, you know, you talk about a race to do something. Uh, this is our modern day race to, to space, if you will. We should be bringing a consortium of our universities, uh, Caltech, Stanford, MIT, uh, you know, run the list. Uh, uh, and they should be working together and we should put uh, huge sums of money into the effort because the day we get 20 days of storage for solar power, we're, we're three quarters of the way there. We're, we're a huge step forward because then we don't have the baseload challenge of how you keep a factory open and keep your economy humming when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining and so forth. Now there are solutions to these things, but they involve building infrastructure. Joe Biden is committed to enormous infrastructure effort. That is the way we're gonna rebuild America post COVID. And that's the way we're going to put millions of people to work and modernize. And in the modernizing of our energy structure and our system, we are going to be healthier, less particulates in the air, less cancer, less expense on health. Uh, we're gonna live better lives and we are going to live up to our environmental responsibilities for future generations. So the plus sides, those are all bad things that happen if John and I are wrong and we make the choice to respond to climate change. But if the deniers and procrastinators are wrong, it's over. So there's no equity in what the balance of choice is here. And uh, I think we just, uh, you know, we've got to connect the dots for people, just connect the dots. Remember, the Marshall Plan was enormously unpopular after World War II. Our President of the United States and, and, and our Secretary of State, George Marshall, recommended that we actually rebuild Germany and Japan. 
a lot of Americans, and I understand it, it just viscerally said, what, are you kidding me? They attacked us. They did this war. But we rebuilt Germany and Japan. And, and the result is today two of the strongest democracies, strongest economic partners, strongest liberal order partners in the world are Germany and Japan. So uh, we've got to have a president who has the ability to open people's imagination to what the benefits are sometimes of investing. It's not an expenditure, it's an investment. Those loans were paid back. In fact, some Marshall Plan loans are still paid back today. So that's what we have to do. Uh, it's all doable. I think it's very exciting. I get excited when I think about, wow, the things that can happen in the creating this. We don't even have an energy grid in America. You can't send solar power from one part of the country all the way to the other. So we have a balanced smart grid system. We don't have that. Imagine if we built that. My God, prices would go down, jobs would be created, life would be better. And that's the image, that's, that's what we have to get people to understand. Yeah. So, so John, what do you think? I mean, that, that sounds wonderful uh, and important, obviously, but, but how do you overcome the divisions? I mean, Europe is a, is a prime example, whether it's Brexit or the, or the political challenges arising in Italy now or, or what's happened in Germany. I mean, how do you overcome uh, you know, the divisiveness and the nationalism to, to move you know, positive policies uh, and solutions forward? Well, look, I think you have to uh, paint a picture uh, along the lines that that the secretary just painted, that the future, uh, that job creation, that uh, the the uh, a, a fair and equitable economy will be built by tackling this problem. And I'm a little bit, I'm rather optimistic about it in one sense, which is young people definitely get this. I think one of the reasons that. Uh, the political system, you see it on the more obviously on the Democratic side. Uh, it hasn't broken the uh, fever grip that, that Trump holds on the Republican Party. But on the Democratic side, uh, in the middle amongst uh, independent voters, people want action. They see what's happening. They see what's happening in our country. They want action. And so I think uh, this movement of, by uh, it happened in the Democratic primaries. It, it's uh, uh, exemplified in the in the two trillion dollar investment program that uh, that Vice President Biden has put forward this summer to get the country out of the recession. Uh, that's all spurred by action coming really from young Americans, and I think that they uh, need to be citizen activists and. They got to go to World War Zero. They go. They can uh, text climate to nine seven 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 nine, but they they've got to talk to their uh, to their peers, to their parents, uh, and I think that'll produce the kind of change that we need. And I don't think any political party has ever survived just by being the stupid party, by ignoring the science, by not listening, uh, <clears throat> by trying to cover up. You know, we now have this Woodward book out that uh, demonstrates that, it, it, again, I come, I come back to COVID, that his uh, sort of complete denial as he's done with climate uh, was not born of the fact that he didn't know about it. He just tried to cover it up. If you keep doing that, you get the consequences that we've seen with this. And we, those consequences are here and they're gonna get worse with respect to climate. So I think the political system is pushing uh, towards action and as uh, you know, each cohort of voters comes in, you know, the younger voters are already completely convinced that we have to do this. And I think they need to spend a little bit of time convincing their parents and grandparents that it's time that they get on the program as well. Here, here. <laughs> Yep. We, um, let's come back to China for a moment or, or Asian countries in general. I mean, you both have, have done enormous work uh, in China. Uh, Mr. Podesta, in particular, you focused on China's role in, uh, in the global climate agreements, um, negotiating the bilateral deal uh, in the run-up to the Paris Accords. What role do you see, do each of you see, and we can take turns on this one again, in, in China, uh, 
for China as a as a contributor or a receiver in terms of global climate migrants. Um, obviously, you know the, the world's largest population, uh, centrally located in uh, in in a on a continent that will be enormously disrupted by this issue that we're talking about. Um, so, so China has a responsibility in terms of, of uh, changing the trajectory of climate change, but also is going to play some central role. What, did, what is that role in terms of the movement of people? Look, I think their central organizing principle is stability in their country. And you see what's going on in Shenzhen uh, with respect to their suppression of the and oppression of the Uyghurs. Uh, they don't seem like a, uh, a, a likely destination for people who are trying to move. On the other hand, they have enormous responsibility to take action to try to provide uh, the a, a kind of stable environment uh, for people in their neighborhood. So I would say the first thing they need to do is stop uh, exporting, uh, uh, you know, th particularly through the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, a lot of uh, polluting coal fire power plants uh, to the rest of the region. And then they're going to have to step up with money and uh, and with support. And I think they can. <coughs> Uh, play uh, a role as a uh, important player in building a structure that, again, provides global stability. But in terms of a destination point for refugees, it's sort of hard to imagine right now. And what about an origination point for, for those refugees? Well, you know, you mean... Uh, I, I think they, that's largely an internal problem. They they are definitely strongly affected, and they know it. Uh, and if you talk to the their their scientists, their their political leaders, they know uh, that whether w whether it's uh, drought, uh, the change of water resource, it's why what they're doing, what they're doing in the uh, Himalayas in terms of trying to divert water into their country. Uh, they know they're very susceptible uh, to dislocation from climate. But I think they, you know, there are a bunch of engineers that run the, the country. <laughs> it's different. In the United States, there's a bunch of lawyers, and in China, it's a bunch of engineers. I think, I think their notion is they will, they will uh, uh, try to keep their internal population uh, in some sort of balance. Uh, what, but I can't, um, it's very hard to imagine them accepting uh, people from the region into the country. I don't know whether the secretary, I, secretary probably agrees with that, but. I totally agree, totally agree. Yeah, and Secretary Kerry, you, you touched on this earlier, but but what about just in terms of, uh, is there more to say about, uh, you know, bringing China back into, um, uh, you know, work on climate change in general, uh, you know, restoring this bilateral agreement. Um, uh, it's an increasingly, you know, uh, adversarial relationship. What are the implications for that um, in terms of addressing, you know, the, the broader global climate and climate migration challenges? Well, I think that uh, part of the increasing tension between our countries is created by the approach of President Trump. Um, I think China is having a lot of difficulty figuring out the reality of uh, his um, approach to trade, which unfortunately began with pulling out of the TPP and giving up a very significant, long worked for presence that we had created in the region uh, with very significant positive implications for America, even though you could find things to disagree with in certain portions of the agreement. And, might have been legitimate to renegotiate some portion of it. Um, and I think he could have, but he didn't even try. He just went straight to tariffs and straight to a trade war. And, um, and, and then has wavered between praising Xi in an unctuous sort of self-serving way and then turning around and bashing him. And I think the Chinese have very little use for our president, frankly. Um, I will tell you an apocryphal story. I, when I was uh, first uh, as secretary, I, I had the privilege of representing our, our, our country at the G20 meeting in Indonesia, and the president couldn't go because our government was shut down. And if you don't think that isn't an embarrassment in the conduct of foreign policy, let me tell you, uh, I remember the jokes of people saying, well, Mr. Secretary, can we offer you a plane to get home? Can we buy you a meal while you're here? I mean, America was being laughed at. Uh, and that's something else we've got to think about, that whatever we're going to do to assert leadership, we need to get our Congress working. 
We need to get our own system of government working. Our democracy is sort of, you know, in, in a gridlock right now, and we're not a particularly great example as we run around the world. But coming back to this issue of China, um, President Xi in Bali said to me, uh, I want to tell you about this program we're going to do. It's called One Belt, One Road. We're going to start doing infrastructure and helping countries to build out around the world. Now, my God, that's the kind of thing we would have wanted to try to do 20 years ago. We'd have begged them to do. And I said to him, you know, that sounds like a great program. Why don't we work on that together? Let's see if we can develop the governing principles and the rules of the road. He said, that's a great idea. We should do that. And for whatever reason, somehow out of our treasury department in Washington came negative vibes about it. And we never got there. We never, this was a decision not made fundamentally. And we wound up going in diverging directions. China also said to me many times, can we join TPP? They would have, they, they, they were, they feared it. They saw it as, as a, a difficulty. Now, I think China is going to be, like it or not, one of the most important relationships that we work on over these next 10, 15, 20 years or longer. We have to be able to work with China. And we have to find out if you're going to deal with North Korea, if you're going to deal with nuclear weapons, if you're going to reconstitute the Iran nuclear agreement in a better way, in a stronger way, which I'd like to see happen. Those things are going to require China. China was there with us before doing this. Russia was there with us before. Even as we sanctioned Russia, we had Russia's cooperation in certain things that we tried to do. And, and that's always been true in diplomatic and diplomacy, that you know, Ronald Reagan talked to the evil empire. He and Gorbachev turned around 50,000 warheads pointed at each other, and now we have 1,500. The, the point is, you've got to talk to people. You can't run around the world bashing people and behaving like all you have to do is tell them what to do. It doesn't work in today's world particularly. So we're going to have to uh, reach out, build up, but also be absolutely firm about things that we disagree with, like human rights, the Uyghurs, other things, and particularly the, the uh, uh, robber baron attitude of their approach to uh, access to the marketplace and theft of, uh, of, of intellectual property and so forth. But we have to work at it. We have to work at this relationship. Thank you. In the couple moments we have left here, I, let's turn our, our focus inward a little bit uh, to the United States. Um, I'm, I'm working on a story now, it'll be out shortly, uh, that looks at internal climate migration in the United States as a growing phenomenon. Um, that, that the near future we will see larger numbers of Americans uh, displaced. We've talked about the current events of, of, of the last month, the wildfires and hurricanes. Um, but there's also just this sort of impending sense of uh, you know intolerable heat and and places becoming uh, you know less and less uh, habitable. So the United States is already experiencing some internal displacement now. Uh, Black and Latino communities are disproportionately affected. We saw uh, we saw that after Hurricane Laura. You know to what degree um, is this internal displacement, uh, you know, a threat to the United States uh, stability, uh, to to its politics, and um, uh, and should it be a security concern? And 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 also, to what degree do you believe? Do you each believe? Uh, and, and Mr. Podesta first that this is, um, you know, has arisen as a uh, you know as a concern for uh, for American leaders so far. Well, you know, I think it that this public consciousness sort of began with Katrina and the lack of resources that went to the poorest people, uh, the spotlight on uh, uh, environmental injustice, uh, but that's continued. And I think uh, the focus to try to kind of plan for and create uh, the, uh, a structure to let people move where they need to, but to find good employment, good paying jobs, doing, again, uh, largely to, to be able to transform the systems that we have, I think have to be a front and center concern. And I, I, you, that's, that's, I think, why, um, again, we keep coming back to the presidential campaign, but uh, Vice President Biden has said 40% of the investments go to distressed communities because they're the people probably in a sense is certainly true globally and it's true nationally too. They contribute the least, they get clobbered the most. And uh, so we have to take account of that and build a more just 
equitable and fair economy. Um, uh, in j just one brief story, uh, uh, Secretary Kerry did, <laughs> did in Indonesia. When I first got to the White House with President Obama, um, came back to the White House because I'd worked for President Clinton. Uh, the first thing we did, uh, you know, everybody was uh, asking how are we going to reduce emissions. The first thing, uh, first big event we did in the White House was we invited the Western governors into the Situation Room for a briefing by the heads of NASA, NOAA, other key leaders, Secretary of Energy, to talk about what their economies are going to look like when the water resource in the West collapses. Mm -hmm. And I think we got their attention. The president attended that meeting. Uh, and we, in fact, got a lot of cooperation on, a, on some key initiatives that we were trying to uh, do uh, with conservative Republican governors in the West. Now, so I think if, if, you, if you work at it, uh, if you have the right principles, if you're guided by the science, and you're making investments that are taking into account those equitable considerations that I talked about, then I think you can build back better. And that's what happened after uh, Sandy struck the East Coast. Uh, we, the, the, uh, the money that was appropriated for that, about a billion dollars went and was spread around the country to build resilience into the system. But you have to be, it has to be top of mind and your government has to be organized to be able to respond to, to those kinds of challenges. And Secretary Kerry, do you, do you think that this nation will look different uh, in a climate change world in terms of, of where our population centers are and, and how we handle that movement of people? Yes, it will. It's not altogether, I mean, there's gonna be some measure of disaster in that transformation because places in Southern Florida and Louisiana, various places are gonna be far more susceptible and some of them will not be habitable. But smaller cities may become bigger we may wind up with bigger, I mean, with better, more modern uh, design in those cities, uh, uh, our school systems, uh, transportation, et cetera. And this is an opportunity to build sustainably for the long term. So I don't see it as, uh, as all tragedy at all. I mean, yes, there will be tragedy associated with it, and it'd be hard for some people to give up homesteads and move away. There are some farmers, though, who just can't survive where they are now already. Uh, the flooding, recurring flooding, and so forth. I mean, we have 500-year floods now every, whatever, every other year or year. So, yes, life will be different, but it doesn't have to be worse. Uh, we can use it with intelligent leadership uh, to make things stronger and better and more sustainable. Great, thank you. And, and Mr. Podesta, last word, I mean, a big picture. Um, where do you see the future on this? Are we gonna be able to pull out you know, the, the more positive opportunities uh, in all that we're talking about in the movement of so many people quickly? Or um, you know, is this just a, well, a doom and gloom scenario? Look, I think we live in a democracy. So that's up to the people. <laughs> Who they vote for, uh, how, you know, how they pressure their elected officials, getting the right policy framework in place. I, you see the, the, uh, the private sector already moving, whether it's uh, in terms of uh, investment uh, and awareness of, of climate in the future. They, they wanna move with this for the most part. You know, there's some resistors in the fossil fuel industry, but mostly they wanna move with it. So the question will be, do you get a policy framework that's gonna make sense? And that ultimately is up to uh, whether people come out to vote and who they vote for. Great. Well, it's fantastic. I want to thank you both for uh, really a phenomenal conversation. It's so wide ranging. There's so much opportunity to go further into it than we were able to hear today. Uh, and if you want to go further into it, then again, I encourage you to go to the World War Zero site and, and check out the magazine Frontline and, um, and read a bit of, of what's offered there. Uh, and uh, I've really enjoyed talking with you both uh, today. It's quite a, a privilege, and, uh, and thank you very much. Thanks for your reporting, Adam. Abraham, you did a great job. Thank you, and keep up the good work.